Um, it's a really a pleasure to be here, um, and a bit humbling, I always think, to be coming uh, to a group of uh, African military leaders um, to be talking about African security issues, things that uh, in many ways many of you are more familiar and living it day to day than I am. But I think it's helpful perhaps to get an external perspective on some of these things and oppression um, from, uh, in, in this case, from my several travels and studies up in Northeast Nigeria, in Niger, and uh, Chad, and Burkina, um, looking at um, some of the problems that we'll be talking about today. Um, but I also hope that we, is, we see this as a way to kind of launch discussions and, and get your opinions um, moving in the, in the discussion sessions I know that will we'll follow. So the first thing to say, and I say this to my class, I say it to US policymakers, this is really not an easy, there are no real easy answers on the problem. Um, you know, there are a lot of studies that say, okay, first do co social cohesion, then you do reconstruction, and then you invest in education and development. Um, each one of those is extremely complicated, uh, difficult to do. Um, and any one component of a solution is, is very hard and it's gonna take a long time. So I think there is some humility that it's needed in, in trying to think of solutions um, to these problems. And then some pragmatic realism about the complexity, the adaptability, and the resilience of these groups and the environment in which they live and, and thrive over time. So in speaking about the, the Lake uh, Chad Basin, I think we really need to think about this as uh, it, it's likely to be the work of decades. Um, I think it's very important uh, not to be fatalistic. It's important to acknowledge and recognize progress and success as, as it happens, uh, but also to continuously challenge current responses, uh, to continuously innovate and look ahead and adjust when needed. And, and the groups have proved very adjustable. Uh, the, the, the battlefield has shifted. The context has shifted. The groups have split, uh, reemerged re, re in different forms. Um, and, and so th there's no, never a time to kind of rest on your laurels and think we've got this uh, now. And if, uh, I think declarations of victory are not helpful. And they tend to reinforce the notion um, that this is a phenomenon that can be simply crushed out uh, of existence with a strong enough military response. <clears throat> but long-term solutions and long-term challenges or long-term problems have their own challenges and long-term <laughs> efforts. First, the focus can shift within any given country. You know, you might have an election coming up. You might have another... Uh, uh, another security problem that kind of uh, uh, pulls your attention away. Issues become politicized. You know, declaration of victory becomes important in political terms, for example, uh, to, uh, or uh, exaggerating the problem or blaming the problem. Um, those issues come, become part of the political discourse and it's not helpful. We're seeing a little bit of that in this country right now. Threat perceptions among the various partners can change. That has to do with the focus shift as well. But if you look in Lake Chad uh, Basin, uh, Nigeria has Boko Haram, yes, but it's got a growing problem in the Northwest uh, with banditry. It has the herder, uh, the so-called herder farmer uh, conflict that is drawing much attention away. Um, it, is, it, it is having a rough political time as well. Chad uh, has Libya to its north. It has AQIM and responsibilities in the G5. It has CAR, it has Sudan and uh, Darfur. Um, it's got a lot of problems and Boko Haram is probably not the most important of them. When you have these kind of joint military uh, 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 operations, whether it's the G5 or, or the uh, multinational joint task force, you also have, and this came very early on in the MNJTF, 
kind of quarrels over uh, who pays, who leads, uh, who's doing more. I mean, that became a kind of a battle between Nigeria and, and uh, Chad played out in the New York Times and others uh, of kind of finger pointing and blame shifting. Um, who leads, who lags, who's more at fault, who's less at fault, and so forth. So that's just kind of the, the nature of uh, and some of the challenges of this very long-term response. I thought I'd just talk about three elements, though, of things that I think are important. I don't think it's anything mind-blowing um, to anyone in the room. Um, and I'm not going to talk about kind of the operational tactics. That's not something I'm, I'm really expert in. Um, but I'm going to talk about the military and security forces, uh, civilians and communities and connecting with them, and then uh, more broadly at the networks that are sustaining uh, these groups, which I think is an often overlooked uh, aspect. First on the military and security forces. Civilian military re relations, and that's the relationship between the military, not only in civilians in government, but civilians and citizens on the ground. That has to happen, uh, in, and that trust needs to be built at the very local level. It needs to happen at the regional level, uh, and it has to happen at the national level. And this is a two-way two street. I think citizens need to realize that many soldiers have lost their lives uh, fighting these groups. Um, that needs to be honored. There is just a... Uh, in Nigeria, kind of revelations of kind of unmarked graves for uh, Nigerian soldiers. Over the last two years, I've, I've seen a number of kind of social media, uh, much more than in, in previous years, of kind of may he rest in peace, you know, valiant fighters who have fought this. And we, you know, the military has, has made some egregious mistakes, but the military is also made up of humans who are sacrificing uh, in many cases, their lives uh, in, this, in this fight against this insurgency. So how do we build up kind of the morale, the ethos of the military, uh, and the public recognition um, of what they do um, to, to be able to kind of elevate them within society as an important, not the only, tool against, um, against this insecurity? But again, it is a two-way street. The military must be as much as possible above reproach. And you know, this is why you know, the accolades go to, go to the military in a place like the US because, and it's not to say there aren't abuses, but because we hold them to a much higher standard of ethics, of behavior, of performance um, than ordinary citizens. We give them, we give them military equipment, um, we give them lots of leeway, they use their judgment on the field, but uh, as a result, we they go through intense ethical training, and it's, it's that that kind of, I think, elevates them in the public's esteem, not just that they're out, you know, killing people. It's that they, they have to hold themselves to a higher standard. In that, civilian protection has to be a priority. Um, you can do all the good work of, uh, you know, investing in infrastructure and jobs and livelihood, um, but if you get a viral video of a soldier or a couple of soldiers brutally killing women and children uh, or torturing uh, suspected uh, extremists um, or uh, perpetrating kind of mass atrocities on, on any kind of uh, community, uh, that's going to set back every developmental effort that you have invested in it. It's also going to quickly erode any trust that you've been able to build up um, between the military um, and, uh, and the population. Um, you know, the U.S. has learned this the hard way. Um, and you look at, a play, you know, you look at Abu Ghraib, uh, you look at Guantanamo, you look at some of the abuses by military forces, ultimately they were mostly held to account, but those abuses set the U.S. reputation and therefore effectiveness back by, by uh, untold amount. Um, so it is a two-way street. Um, this goes not just for the military, but for kind of the prison system, 
the, uh, the system of detention, interrogation of captured fighters is extremely important. But we know, at least most of us know, that torture is not going to be the best way to extract torture, beating, and deprivation is not the best way to extract vital information. Um, you know, how do you build up effective interrogation techniques? It's absolutely vital, um, but you don't want to do so at the cost of, uh, of due process and your, uh, and your reputation. Um, with the broader public, uh, you need open, honest communication from the top. We have, and this is not just in the Lake Chad Basin, but in many places, you know, denial, denial that soldiers have been killed, vastly exaggerated uh, figures of uh, extremists that have been killed, uh, and then it kind of gets walked back, and then it gets walked forward, and everybody's in some doubt, and there's one outlet, one military outlet saying one thing, one, another military spokesperson saying another. It's confusing, and that kind of thing undermines trust as well. So getting a strategic communications strategy on what the military is doing, why it's doing it, and what is happening so that people can, uh, can truly trust that the information that they're getting is real is also an important part of building that local and that national trust. There's a huge trust deficit dating back quite some time in the early days of the Boko Haram insurgency. Uh, there were some horrific abuses, and that is a deficit that needs to uh, ultimately be, uh, um, you know, militaries need to dig their, their selves out of that. Second, on civilians and community. Um, there, I mean, in addition to the military and security forces reaching out to civilians and communities, uh, the the national government, the uh, the federal, the the state government, and the local governments need to be doing so the same, and in a coordinated way. You know, we think, okay, we're going to train carpenters, or we're going to do, you know, we're going to do schooling, or this or that. There's oftentimes not much conversation with local communities from the national level about what it is actually that they want to prioritize and what they might think might be the more effective solutions. And that, it's not just, perhaps they don't have the best answers because they're not looking at the bigger picture, but, to, but the fact that they have input into the process and see some kind of agency in the solutions for their local, um, for their local problems is incredibly important. We tend to think of a lot of the people, the civilians and communities affected by this as just kind of uh, victims waiting for help from the federal government. There are actually numerous individuals and communities who are stepping up, creating schools, finding, you know, creating schools for former Boko Haram fighters and for those killed by Boko Haram. Uh, uh, trying to integrate an Islamic and a, a secular um, a, a, a curriculum in, in consultation with, with the parents or the caregivers. There are people giving their uh, land and, and compounds over to internally displaced people, uh, mobilizing money to feed them. Women in the camps are sewing hats, they're, they're finding charcoal. People have agency within this. And I think another thing worth doing is kind of identifying those pockets of where, where people are um, really making a difference uh, and try to support that versus coming in as this deus ex machina that comes in to fix, fix the problems. Um, so there are people at the local level who have good ideas on what they want and what they need. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, kind of vigilante groups and self-defense groups. Uh, when I was in Maduguri the first time, uh, people said, you know, those guys did fantastic work. It was them that were able to, to change the tide against Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda, sorry, Boko Haram. Um, not that they were the fighting force, uh, but that they became the eyes and ears that the military did not have within the communities. Um, and uh, were able to report we're able to help 
informants by kind of conveying the information themselves. Previous to that, informants had no protection, and so uh, were very reluctant to go to the security authorities uh, with information. So that model of kind of how, you know, intermediaries, uh, trusted intermediaries between the community and the security forces who can relay that kind of sensitive information kind of with a campaign, you know, see something, say something, we say in this country. Um, but, you know, having a channel through which to do it uh, where you are not immediately put at risk is really important. So those communications, the rapid communications, something's happening here, uh, that gets quickly relayed to the military forces, and then, of course, the military needs the capacity to rapidly respond as well. But kind of building that kind of trust between communities and that kind of communication line is, uh, is, is very important. Lots of concerns with some of these uh, uh, vigilante groups or the self-defense groups, even from some of the members themselves who say, you know, we're not going to tell these guys to go back to, their, to the, what they were doing before, you know, that they've kind of been at the forefront of this, they've been lauded. Uh, and praised for their work. Um, they've held guns, they've had, had positions of power. You're not gonna tell you know, a 20-year-old now, just go back and, and do your kiosk or, or whatever you might have been doing before. And so I think finding ways to celebrate and uh, what they've done without kind of creating a Frankenstein um, that becomes kind of a, a force of its own and a danger of its own is important. Part of that may be integrating some of these uh, uh, individuals into forces, and that's being done. Uh, some of it may be institutionalizing that, that format of <coughs> connectivity in some way, institutionalizing it in ways that have more accountability, uh, have, have rules and boundaries and parameters put around them. Um, but the, that, you know, that was kind of an organic connection between communities and the military that grew up, I think it's worth trying to make it work uh, and make it uh, remain accountable as well. One thing that uh, you know, occurred to me as I was thinking about this today was I did a lot of work on the polio epidem ep epidemic in Northeast Nigeria. Um, and it was, people thought, you can't do it, there's too much conflict. But it was actually the Nigerian government was fairly successful at it. And the components that made it successful were A, a huge priority put on this, uh, B, new technologies like GPS and micro-mapping of communities, and then the levels of government, the federal government, the state government, and the local government had continuous contact and feedback and held each other accountable. Um, there was celebration when, uh, you know, an additional village was vaccinated. There, you know, there was, you know, kind of almost a healthy competition uh, among those groups to kind of come to the weekly meetings of all three levels of government and kind of celebrate and, and hold each other accountable. Um, it's, it's not totally the same, um, but I think what made it work in the Nigeria system is difficult because of this, and many governments, because of this tiered level of, of government. Um, kind of ha finding ways to synchronize and make sure there's feedback from the very local um, to the top. <coughs> um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about employment opportunities and so forth. All of those things are kind of obvious, and um, you know, the question is, how do you do that? One thing, <clears throat> just I'll say one thing, and I think this goes for the Sahel too, is how do you build linkages between these marginalized communities that often look to, you know, many people in Northeast Nigeria look to Chad for livelihood, for smuggling, or for, for goods, not to the big economy in, in Southern Nigeria. How do you connect better those marginalized communities to the national economy, to the national psyche, uh, and to the national discourse. If you look at a uh, demographic health surveys, whether it's in the LAC region of Chad, the DIFA region of Niger, or Borno uh, state in Nigeria, those places have, you know, we know the least education, lowest education levels and development. But interestingly, they have the least regular access to national media, 
whether it's radio, whether it's newspaper, or whether, you know, television, it's not going to happen. Um, but <clears throat> the fact that they are not really tuned in and kind of integrated with national discourses, uh, I think is an important, it's just a thought-provoking uh, question about how to better integrate those marginalized communities. Could be North, Northern Mali, it could, you know, uh, could be parts of Somalia as well into it. I know I'm kind of going on. Let me just, my final point is the, um, what I think has gotten less uh, attention, and that is the fact that these groups, you can call them religious extremist groups, but they, it's a fine line between that and just the criminal networks um, that sustain them. And it almost becomes <clears throat> difficult to discern over time which is the more important motivator. And, uh, you know, ISIS, West Africa, they're not just making money out of the fish trade, uh, you know, or robbing local banks. Uh, I think a lot more needs to be done on understanding uh, the, the larger networks um, that feed them, where they store their money, how the money is laundered, um, <clears throat> what are the roots uh, in. Uh, and that takes a much bigger effort than just uh, in, the, in the immediate region. There's a lot of, uh, there's some reporting, and uh, Eben Barlow, who some of you may know, uh, who's controversial, but uh, uh, a very uh, smart guy on this in South Africa, talks about the used, the import of used vehicles in South Africa, um, and how um, they are, uh, there are suspected ties between that, you know, legitimate trade, um, but carrying cash, arms, uh, munitions, um, up through to Boko Haram and, and other groups. <clears throat> that means that we, and but that means that South Africa has to take this question seriously. If you're gonna track the financial sustainers of these groups, it's not gonna come from the immediate default lac uh, Borno economies. There's just, there's not enough there. You have to think much more further afield and it, in that way, it's really a criminal enterprise, and it requires kind of a law enforcement, a financial intelligence, and uh, a, a whole nother set of tools that I think hasn't been fully used um, in the Lake Chad Basin, nor to some extent in the Sahel or in Somalia. So I'll end there, and I hope that was helpful, um, and love to hear questions, and looking forward to uh, the Dean.